So uh, t today's class, I'm going to finish up for the OTP stuff that we missed last time. I'm going to cover a little bit, uh, go over again some of the things that people had questions about, and then we'll jump into the last lecture on distributed o OLAP systems. So again, as a reminder, uh, project four is due a week from now. Um, and then next Monday in class, we'll have Barry Morris from NeoDB come give a talk about their system. And then on Wednesday, December 6th, I'll do the system potpourri of picking different systems that you guys want to learn about, and I'll give 15 minutes to each of them. But again, also we'll have the final review in the beginning, and I'll be handing out the paper copies of the practice final exam. So again, if you haven't, go, haven't voted yet, please go to that URL and, and vote. All right, so the last class, um, uh, let's see all of you, screen pointer options. So last class, people had some questions about um, the, the sort of the centralized coordinator versus the, uh, the, the sort of the, the standalone coordinator versus the, the middleware. So again, we're talking about a centralized coordinator for our, uh, for our distributed database system to do transactions. And for the partitions, again, if this could be done in either a shared disk architecture or a shared nothing architecture. I'll explain what I mean by logical versus physical partitioning uh, later in the lecture. But basically think of this as like, this is where, these are the, the machines over here that control these individual partitions. And so the, the, so the, the coordinator approach is akin to the TP monitor that I mentioned before, where this is a st separate piece of software that could be external to the system, the data system could be internal to it, uh, but it's sort of this separate thing that you, the application goes to in order to do anything on the actual database system. Right? So in the TP monitor case, I said this is from the 70s and 80s when people had these enterprise applications that had these disparate databases and they didn't have a way to federate them, do transactions across to them. So a TP monitor would be the standalone coordinator that could say, all right, if you want to do a transaction on this machine or this database, you can do it there, plus you can do another transaction over here, and I'll make sure that they, get, they both get committed atomically. So the application server goes to the coordinator, says I want a lock request uh, to lock these partitions, and then the coordinator is maintaining the state information about what transaction controls uh, or locks what particular data item. And I'm showing partitions, but you could get, can be at a finer granularity uh, like the way we talked about when we talked about two-phase locking. So then once you get the, the locks, you get an acknowledgement, and then now you're allowed to access the, the partitions and do whatever it is that you need to do. And again, I said the, the coordinator doesn't know exactly what's going on inside of the, par the, the partitions on how you actually modify the data because it doesn't see those queries, right? It just, it just knows that you want to lock something uh, to do something, and then it allows you to go ahead and do that. But when you want to commit, you go to the coordinator, and then it's up for the coordinator to then coordinate with everyone uh, to, to, for all the partitions that you modified or accessed and say, this transaction wants to commit, are you allowed to commit? And again, we have to, we're doing it this way because the different partitions don't know what you did at the other partitions. It only knows what it did locally. So it can only make a decision about whether your, your transaction is allowed to commit based on what, you, you know, what it knows, what it sees. And then once everybody commits, then you, you get back an acknowledgement that your transaction's done. So the, the, I wanted to contrast, though, with this with the middleware approach, where the middleware is essentially a proxy where all your transaction and query requests go through that middleware. And the middleware is going to maintain its own lock table or whatever else information that it has to figure out who, who's modifying what data on what partitions. And so for this, the application server only sees the middleware machine and it sends all the requests there. And then the middleware, its job to figure out where it, where it is that actually you need to go to do the operation you want to do. And then when you want to commit, it's responsible for talking to the other partitions and saying, all right, are we allowed to commit this transaction? So then, then contrast this now with the centralized coordinators where essentially the partitions are going to organize themselves and figure out uh, whether the transaction is allowed to commit or not. And the way you do this is you typically have, you, you have to have one transaction be the coordinating transaction or, or the home partition that communicates with the other partitions and they decide whether it's safe to commit your transaction. So now I th what I think was tripping up people was uh, when we started talking about two-phase commit. So in all these cases, this safe to commit part that I'm showing here, this is the two-phase commit that we'll, I'll go over again real quickly. So even though you have a centralized coordinator or you have a middleware or whether it's a decentralized system, you're still going to use two-phase commit to talk to the little partitions, get them to agree that it's safe to commit your transaction 
Uh, and then when, when they go ahead and say that's okay, then you actually go ahead and do the commit. So now if we jump now to where we left off uh, with two-phase commit, again, this two-phase commit, the atomic commit protocol we're going to use to allow a transaction that has touched multiple nodes to go ahead and commit atomically across all of them. And I said that two-phase commit is the most common approach used in distributed databases. Uh, there is a three-phase commit, but no one uses that. But then there's also these consensus protocols from the dis distributed systems world, like Paxos, Raft, and Zab. Um, and you can use these to do the atomic commit, but in practice, everyone does two-phase commit. Again, the basic idea of two-phase commit is really simple. Uh, the application server says, I want to commit. Then whatever is the, the whatever node you, you go to to say I want to commit is considered the coordinator, and then everybody else is our participants. And then the first phase, you say, all right, this transaction wants to commit, is that okay? And they say yes. Uh, and then you go back and say, all right, well, now everyone agrees to commit, so go ahead and commit. And then you get back the acknowledgement that they committed. Now, at this point, once you get back the acknowledgements after the second phase, the transaction is considered to be fully committed, and therefore, you can return the uh, acknowledgement to the application server to say your transaction has, has committed. And then if, you, if, you, if, if one participant decides that they don't want to commit the transaction and they send an abort message uh, in the prepare phase, then everyone, uh, then you immediately go back and tell the application server that you committed, uh, and then, the, um, then you just tell everyone that they aborted. Now, what could happen on our two-phase commit is that in the first round, everyone says okay here, right? But then in the second round, the second phase, one of these guys could come back and say, uh, I failed, right? I don't, I'm not committing, right? In that case, then the transaction is considered aborted and you have to then clean things up. But in practice, that, that doesn't happen, right? And usually the optimization everyone does is once you get the first phase back and everyone sends their acknowledgement, you don't wait to, you don't have to wait to figure out what happens to the, the subsequent phase. You can just tell the application server that you, you committed. Technically, this is not correct. It opens up a small window for possible failures. Uh, you can sort of get around this in some ways by logging every step you do in two-phase commit. Um, but in practice, this, this is what everyone does because it just, it's, you, it's one less round trip you have to do to get data or to, to to commit the transaction. So is this, is this clear what two-phase commit is? Again, we have, to, we have to do this if we're in a shared disk or a shared nothing architecture, right? Because we have to coordinate between the different nodes. So this also works for decentralized work? His question is, does this work for decentralized? Yes. Yeah, so his, his statement is, uh, his statement is, in, in, in theory, on our two-phase commit, any node that, that was involved in the, actually any node in the cluster could be designated the coordinator, right? And the protocol technically would still work correctly. In practice, though, it's, you know, say it's a decentralized system, you go to one server and say, begin my transaction, that ends up being the coordinator, right? And again, you typically want to have the coordinating node be the one where you did most of the work, right? So that way, most of your queries go to this, and it has the most information about the state of your transaction there, and can do things like, all right, well, I know I'm not going to commit at all because you've done something you shouldn't be allowed to do at this node, so I'm not going to bother doing two-phase commit. I'm just going to tell everyone that we aborted. But this can be a little bit like the, uh, the, the one where you use like a, uh, like a coordinator Oh, uh, so his, 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 great. So his statement is, um, yeah, his statement is, in this case here, uh, this essentially looks like the same thing as the centralized model. Yes, right? You, you need a coordinator always. You need something to say, all right, I'm in charge of deciding whether we're allowed to commit, right? The difference, though, is, so this server here executed a transaction, it went to node one, and it tried to commit by telling node one I wants to commit, 
So node one is the coordinator for this. But another transaction at the exact same time could be going to node two and trying to commit there. And then there's another you know, round of, of two-phase commit going on where that guy's the coordinator and this guy's just a participant. So any node in the cluster uh, could be a coordinator in a decentralized model. Whereas in the centralized model, it's always that, that single, uh, single uh, software piece, that a component that's doing this. OK. All right, so again, the, the, the things we've got to deal with is if the coordinator crashes, then the participants have to figure out what to do. And again, typically what happens in a distributed environment, you, know, you don't get a notification that the, uh, immediately that a node goes down. It's typically like there's a heartbeat to say, are you still alive, are you still alive? And at some point, you don't get the heartbeat from the other machine. And then you time out and decide that I need to commit transaction. Um, but essentially what happens to happen, though, is like you have to have, in, under a two-phase commit, you have to have all the nodes still up to commit the transaction, because if one of them goes down, the whole thing has to uh, abort. And then if one of the participants goes down during this, the coordinator would just assume that the other guy responded with the abort, and it goes ahead and aborts that transaction. Right, typically, if the coordinator crashes, then you would, one of these guys, one of the transactions would time out, and the... Um, you could send a message back to the, to the client application server to say your transaction was aborted, but typically the connection between the server, between the client and the server just times out, and then the, the, the application has to decide whether it can find out whether that transaction committed or not. Okay, so again, the key thing here is though is uh, two-phase commit is, is, a, is considered a blocking protocol as opposed to Paxos, because once there is a uh, failure, you have to wait around to figure out what, what, what to actually do next, All right? So I don't know how much too much I want to go into Paxos here, um, but I'll just say that it is uh, two-phase commit is actually considered a degenerate case of Paxos. So at at a high level, they're they're, they're essentially the same. The difference is that in two-phase commit, uh, if the coordinator fails, then you have to block everybody, um, and you have to have all the participants vote that they agree to commit the transaction. Whether in Paxos, you just need a majority of participants to say that it's OK to commit something or, or abort, right? Um, well, maybe we'll talk about Paxos next week when we talk about Spanner, because uh, that's what everyone's always going to vote for to talk about the last class. But again, the basic idea to understand this is that you can use Paxos for things like leader election. Uh, you can also use it as a replacement of two-phase commit. But in practice, everyone does two-phase commit to commit transactions, and then use Paxos or RAF to do leader election. OK? So again, so there's this great paper from Jim Gray and Leslie Lamport from, I think, the, the mid-2000s, uh, where they basically prove that, or they show that two-phase commit is, again, is, is, is a subset of what Paxos does. OK. So now we're going to talk about replication. So this is really important in a uh, distributed system, because obviously now if um, if a machine goes down and we have our databases partitioned, say in a shared nothing architecture, if one machine goes down out of a thousand, we don't want to have to stop an entire system, right? Technically, we, we should if that happens because now the database is essentially offline, right? Because a portion of it is not available and we could get false, neg false negatives or false positives when we execute queries on that data that we can't see. So the way we get around this is by replicating the data at, at a partition. So there's essentially two types of configurations you can do for this. You can have master-slave, also sometimes called leader-follower. And you can have multi-master replication, sometimes called multi-home. Uh, it's not considered um, kosher to, to use the term master-slave anymore. Um, and so I'll slip up, because I'm old and I'll say this, but I, it, people sometimes try to say leader-follower, or sometimes I say master-replica, but it's the same idea. And then you have actually two ways to propagate the changes now. Uh, you can do what's called physical logging or logical logging. And this is going to look a lot like recovery we talked about last week, because it is essentially the same thing. So essentially what's going to happen is we're going to use Aries to do our logging as we do it, as we execute transactions on a machine. And then we're essentially going to transmit the write-ahead log, the changes that we're making over the, the wire now to our replicas. And they're essentially going to be all in this sort of special recovery mode where they're just going to re keep replaying all the op log or write ahead log entries you send it and applying it to the database. Right? Using, again, the same protocol as we, as we talked about with, with Aries. Um, 
And so with physical logging, you're essentially again sending over the, the, the bytes that you actually made, you, that you modified, and the, the replica will, will replay them. And then logical logging is, again is just sending over the queries and they get re-executed on the, on the other side. So let's talk about how to do the different uh, system configurations. So the first approach is called master slave or master replica. Um, and again, the basic idea here is that you have some master node or master partition. And this is where all your writes are going to go to. You also, you also can re have transactions read data from, from this master. But the key thing is though, all the writes have to go to this. Then anytime you modify data at, this, at the master node or master partition, it then sends the, the op log update over the wire to its replicas. And so now, because the replicas are technically going to be slightly behind the, the, uh, the, the master in this case, you're only allowed to do reads against the, uh, the replicas, right? All updates have to go to the master, and then you, if you want to read possibly sort of slightly stale data, you can read them from, from the replicas. So this is good if you have a workload where you, the, the, you're not that insert heavy, you can always go to this master node, it, it can handle everything, or the master, the, the master uh, partition. Um, and if you have a lot of reads, and those reads can be slightly stale, then you can always go spread them out across the, uh, the, the replicas. In multi-master, what happens is every node is considered to be uh, the, you know, have a complete copy, an exact copy of the data at all times. And so what happens is that, or at least for this partition, what happens is that you have to then transmit the updates back and forth between the, these different partitions to make sure that they're, they're always in sync. So in this case here, the reads and writes can go to either one. And then you have to figure out uh, using you know, uh, two-phase commit and whatever configuration protocol you're using to make sure that these things are, are always in sync. Right? The advantage of this is that uh, if you crash in the multi-master case, um, you immediately know that the, you know, one of the nodes, if one of those crashes and the other node has an exact copy without missing any data, because they're always going to be maintained perfectly in sync. And obviously, that's, that's actually much, much slower. Or in the master-slave uh, master environment, depending on how you propagate your changes to the replicas, you could have a transaction commit on the master, and then it crashes, and then before that change gets propagated to the replicas. In the back, yes? Could you have a setup where um, you combine master-slave replication with um, sharding? Yes, he brings up a very good point. So in this case here, I'm, I'm being really simple and I'm only showing a single partition, right? So his comment was, let's say I have two partitions and I'll have this node here be the master for partition one and then this node here will be a replica for partition one, but it's also going to be the master for partition two and this will be the replica for partition two. Uh, yes, you can, you can do that. Some, I'm trying to, I think I'm trying to get the system offhand who does this. Uh, DB2, the parallel version of DB2, I might do that. Um, I don't know of any, any of the open source guys that do this. They both, yeah, I, I think only that, you know, that only shows up in the commercial systems. Um, but yeah, and so again, the advantage of this is that uh, the tricky thing, though, is if you have transactions that uh, span partitions, then this has become problematic because now where do you go? Do you go to the master P1 or the, 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 the master P2? Um, that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't think any of the open source systems do this, but I, I could be wrong. Um, so again, the, the, the thing I want to stress here, though, in a distributed environment is this could be really slow. So think about this now, right? I have to, uh, you know, say in the master, master replica setup, I'm going to do my write on the master and then propagate the changes to the replicas. And I have to, depending you know, how, how, how much I care about the, the safety of my data, I may have to wait until this thing flushes over here before I can then send the acknowledgement back. Um, and then depending on where the replica is located, that might be a, a long network round trip. right? Originally, uh, I don't know if this is still true anymore, but the way Facebook did uh, replication was in this model here. And so the, the master copy of the data would always be uh, 
uh, somewhere on the, on the West Coast in the US, but then they would have copies of the data at different data centers around the world. So anytime you, re you would read your, your timeline or whatever it's called on your Facebook page, you would read from the replica that's close to you. But anytime you did an update to uh, again, your, your feed or whatever it's called, uh, that write would always have to go to the, the master copy of the, of the database at the, the, data center, the data center on the West Coast. And so the way they would trick you to, see, to make it look fast is that uh, they would maintain a little uh, 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 a cookie in your browser so that when you did your write to update your feed, uh, the change may have not made it to the, the master node yet because it's far away. But then if you try to refresh the page right away, then they would have a little, they would do a, have a local cache to say, all right, you know, here's, the fee, here's the thing you just posted, even though it's actually not real in the database yet. I think since then they now have, they actually do now the multi-master approach. And they have a way to sort of keep this sync on, underneath the covers. All right, so regardless of what setup you have, uh, I, I, sort of, I sort of mentioned this briefly, but like you can also change on how much you have to, how, um, you can also change whether the master has to wait for the replica to fully commit the data that, that you sent over to it. Uh, before it sends the acknowledgement back to the application. You can actually change whether you want to do this or not. And then this, this is sort of like you're sacrificing, um, you're sacrificing the, uh, the, the durability or the consistency of your data because you're saying, all right, maybe I'll commit to the master and I'll tell the, tell the server, the application, that I've committed your data, but the data hasn't been propagated to the replica yet. So if I crash before that happens, then my data gets lost. Right? And so for some applications, this is OK. For other things, you don't want to do this. Um, and so you can tune what the propagation level is for these different protocols, or the different replication protocols. So the, 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 mo the most protective one is to do synchronous replication. And this is where the mat, and for this we'll assume we're doing master-slave setup. For this one, the master is going to send the updates to the replica, and then it's going to wait for the replica to apply that change locally to its copy of the data and then it sends back the acknowledgement, and then and only then does it actually send out the acknowledgement to the client that your transaction is committed. All right, so it looks like this. Say we have a simple two-server two setup with a master and a slave, right? The application says, hey, I want to commit my transaction. So the master then goes to the replica, hey, we, here's, this, here's, here's the changes we made. Can you go ahead and flush this? Now, at this point here, it has to stall and wait until that server takes the, takes the packets of the message you sent over, fully applies it to the database, writes it out to the log, and flushes it. And once that's done, then the, the, the replica will send back the acknowledgement and say, I got the data, I flushed it, and we're done. And then at that point, the master knows that the data has been propagated to its replicas, and then go ahead and send back the, the acknowledgement to the, to the client. With asynchronous replication, what happens is, the application server says, hey, I want to commit. Maybe you prop send a message out to the replica and say, hey, can you go ahead and flush this? But you don't wait to see whether it actually flushes it. You immediately go back to the, uh, to the application and say, yes, your, your data is fully committed, or your, your, your write is done. And then at some point, eventually, the replica will get, you know, get the packet, write out the change to flush it, and it's done. And now it's fully copied. So this is. So the way to think about this, these are like sort of knobs you can tune in, your, in the database server to say what, how you want to, to do, do replication. And it's the same way you can tune knobs to specify how strongly durable do you want the, the write-ahead log to be. Right? If you want things to always be fully, fully, uh, fully acid, then you make sure that any time your transaction commits, you do the f-sync to flush out the changes from the write-ahead log buffer out onto stable storage. But if you maybe don't care that much, or you're allowed to sacrifice a, a, and have a small window of vulnerability, then you can do asynchronous, where you don't wait for the f-sync, and then you just immediately return back the acknowledgement to the application that your transaction is committed. Same thing here, right? You're not going to wait for the flush on the replica and the acknowledgement that, that it's actually durable. You immediately go back to the, to the application and say, I got the data that you wanted. Semi-synchronous is a term that comes from uh, uh, MySQL, and it's sort of like a halfway in, halfway in between uh, the asynchronous and the synchronous. So what happens is the application tells the, the master, I want to commit. Then you send the message to say, hey, flush to the, 
to the replica. And then what happens is the, I mean, so you have to stall for that. But what happens is the, the replica will immediately come back and say, I got your message. I will flush it eventually. All right? And then you immediately send back the, the acknowledgment to the master, and then the master can tell the, the, the server I got, or the, the application server that I committed your, your transaction. And then at some later point, it'll end up actually getting flushed to disk. All right? So just think, again, we're sort of shrinking the window of the vulnerability for, for us losing data by, you know, we know that our packet made it to the other machine, but it hasn't been applied yet. And that's, and that's considered good enough. Um, so again, this is called, on MySQL, this is called semi-synchronous. Uh, I don't know how many other systems actually, actually do this. So, so is this clear? So again, the master, master replica, master slave setup is probably the most common one. Uh, Multi-master is a bit more tricky, and it's, and, and it's less common. OK. So I'm going to skip the discussion about the cap theorem. Um, We'll, we'll cover that, we can cover that next week. Um, if you understand two-phase commit, then that's sort of the, the main protocol you're going to use. Paxos allows you to, to do other things. Um, so just to finish up for transaction, distributed transaction processing, I, like as I said, I, I barely scratch the surface on all the things that actually matter, uh, or things you have to worry about. Um, we could probably teach an entire semester on distributed databases and still not, not cover everything. Um, but again, the, 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 the main thing I want you to get out of this is like it's all, it's all the same techniques we've, we've covered throughout the semester, but now we just have to worry about other things uh, in addition to you know, the regular transaction processing, durability, and other things, because now we're in a distributed environment and we could have failures and we could have other things, other, other problems. So in, in practice, it's really hard to get strong asset transactions in a distributed environment. Uh, this is why most of the NoSQL systems don't actually do this, right? And the reason is, is because it's hard to get right, and it's also hard to get to run, to run efficiently. So they forego transactions and, and other strong consistency guarantees in exchange for, for better performance and, and availability. So uh, if you want to learn more about distributed transaction processing and actually see how real systems, uh, both open source and commercial, stack up, to all sort of the, the, the lofty goals of asset transactions, uh, you should go check out Kyle Kingsbury's blog on what he calls the Jepson Project. Um, Kyle, Kyle's a funny guy. Uh, he basically wrote a, a torture device for distributed databases. So he has this nice nifty environment where he can have these, he can simulate failures and network partitions and all these problems, and you can see, and he tests to see how distributed databases react to these sort of hostile environments. And what's really fascinating about it is that uh, oftentimes companies make claims about how durable or strong and consistent their, their systems are. Kyle comes along and destroys them, and they have to go back and change their marketing uh, to say that they're actually not as, is, is not as strong and consistent as they thought they were. Um, so, I will say, though, these blog articles he writes are extremely detailed and methodical. Uh, like, I, so I, I cannot recommend it enough, but like, you should dedicate time to actually understand what he's talking about. And that, I think it's, it's really good. So now, basically, Kyle has a consultant company where database companies hire him to come again, come on site, and, and torture their systems and see what happens, see how they fail. And it's actually really interesting because it's like then they figure out, oh, we have these problems, and then they can fix them to overcome his, his issues. OK, so any questions about distributed transaction processing? All right, so now we'll get to the, what we want to talk about today. And that's distributed, tra distributed analytical processing. Okay, so we'll skip all this because we cover this. All right, and again, the, the, the reason why I broke up these two lectures is that for transaction processing, it's concurrency control, it's replication, it's two-phase commit, all of those things we have to care about because we want to make sure that our, our transactions are acid. Uh, in a OLAP environment, we're mostly going to be read-only. We mostly want to read large segments of the data and do complex aggregations and joins on them. So we have a, a bunch of different other problems we're going to have to deal with. So we still have to care about, uh, you know, we still have to worry about, you know, are we fault tolerant and things like that. Um, 
as we did in a distributed transaction processing workload. But now we don't need to care so much that, that we can, you know, that our queries are, are, are you know, their updates are, doing, are durable and things like that, because we're not trying to do a lot of them all at once. All right, so for today, we're first going to now talk about partitioning. Again, partitioning is relevant to, uh, in the LHP environment, but I want to motivate to see why it actually matters a lot more as well in a uh, analytical environment. And then we're going to finish up talking about distributed join algorithms, because that's the main, where you're going to spend most of your time in a distributed OLAP system uh, doing this. And we want to sort of see how, why, you know, what, what cases we have to deal with and why this can be problematic. So as I said before, the idea of database partitioning is that we want to split the database up across multiple resources. Right? And this can be done uh, on multiple nodes. Uh, this can be done on multiple CPU sockets. Right? We basically want to split the database up so that we can have different computational units or storage units crunch on different segments of the data at the same time. Right? We can sort of paralyze our operations. Um, and as I said, in the NoSQL world, they'll call part database partitioning sharding. But the idea is basically the same. So what's going to happen is that for in a OLAP environment, we're going to have a single query come in, and we're going to go through the normal you know, planner optimization phase that we talked about before. But then we're going to break up that query into different fragments uh, that will get distributed across the different resources or partitions. And those partitions will then compute their portion of the query based on the fragment they're given. And then we have to then later on combine them, put them back together as a single result to the application. Right, so if you open up your terminal, you type a select statement into it uh, in a distributed database system, then underneath the covers, it'll go out and actually distribute your query across multiple machines, and then put it, put it all together back to a single result and send that back to your terminal. So the most naive scheme, the way to do partitioning, is just, just take every single table you have in your database and assign it to a different partition. Right? Uh, this obviously assumes that you're going to have enough storage space or memory to, to handle, with your, handle that single table. Um, but it's really like it's, it's the easiest thing to do because you don't have to worry about uh, how to figure out what, you know, what key to use to distribute your data. Right? So it's a really simple example like this. I have two tables. The first table is going to go to one partition. The next table is going to go to the other partition. And then I'm done. Right, so now if I have a query that has a touch to touch the two different tables, uh, I do have to then you know, move data around or copy data around as needed. Um, but in the case of doing updates, all my updates for a single table could go to one location. Right, and so the ideal case is a, is a single select statement that only accesses one table, because you don't have to do any shuffling or any data movement at all. Um, so this is often done, um, this is sometimes done in some systems where the you don't read to a table. You just mostly just insert into it, like a log table. So I know MongoDB can do this, where you can say, all right, one table should be on a single shard by itself, or a single partition by itself, and then all your inserts go there, and you never worry about going and reading again. Um, but if you have a complex query that has to join these two tables, then you're going to have to move a, a lot of data around. All right, so this, this is typically done for OLTP, not so much for OLAP. What people do normally do instead is called horizontal partitioning. And again, when people talk about sharding, they, they essentially mean this. Um, and this is where we're going to pick some set of attributes from the table we're going to use to decide how to assign a particular record to a, a partition on a, on a node. And as I said before, the partitioning can be done either at the physical level, meaning the actual phys lo physical location of the data itself, or done at a logical level, where the, sort of th the, the nodes that are actually your queries on a particular segment of the, of the table will be assigned the, the, that logical partition. So they'll go out to the shared disk and just get the data they, they know they need for the partition they're assigned to. And I'll, I'll show an example of that in, in the next few slides. But so basically, again, for horizontal partition, what's going to happen is we have some table. This one has uh, four attributes. And so we're going to pick one attribute to be the partitioning key. It doesn't have to be one, it can be multiple ones, but for this one, we'll pick one. And then, uh, depending on whether we're using hash partitioning or range partitioning, well, for each tuple, we're going to look at the value of that column and then decide where to send the, where to, where to physically store, where, where to assign, what partition to assign that tuple to. Right? So in this case, if I'm doing hash partitioning, I'm going to take every tuple, 
I'm going to hash it and then mod by the number of partitions I have, in this case four, and then that's going to tell me uh, what partition each, each record assigns to, and then they get mapped to those partitions. If you were doing range partitioning, you could then say, you know, A to B goes to one partition, C to D goes to another partition, and then E to F goes to another partition. Right? It's basically the same idea. Um, depending on what kind of system, or depending on what your workload looks like, uh, this, you know, depending on what your workload lo work looks like, will tell you what actually what attribute you want to partition on. So some attributes are obviously better than, than others. Right? So say you have like an auto increment key and your workload is always inserting new records and the increment key is always going up. So if you do range partitioning on that, uh, what will happen is uh, all your inserts will go to a one partition for, for a brief period, then the partition will fill up, and then all the inserts will go to another partition for, for another period. Because right? it's sort of broken up on those ranges and your auto increment key is always increasing in monotonically, uh, monotonic order. So that would be bad because now you're, you're, you're blasting everything to a single partition. But if I have queries that, uh, if, I, if I, my workload is not updating the data that often and I want to do queries that have to touch all of this data, then maybe that's good because that'll evenly distribute all the different keys across different servers um, and I can have better parallelism in my, in my, for my queries. So typically what happens is the DBA will look at your qu workload, look at the query traces, Look at like, your database and then make a manual decision about how to partition things. Um, there are tools to figure this out automatically. MongoDB has this auto sharding feature where if, you're, if your shard gets too big, they basically split it in half and move it across different machines. Yes? That's a great question. So his question is, in this case here, I'm basically doing static partitioning, right? Because I'm fixing the number of nodes that I have uh, when I mod n, right? Or the number of partitions I have. So if I now add a new partition, I basically have to reshuffle everything uh, because that you know it's now it's mod five. So yes, so in this case here, in this particular example, you would have to reshuffle things. Um, so systems like Apache Cassandra, for example, they do what's called consistent hashing, and think of it as the hash table is basically logically is a is a ring, and then when you add or drop a new node, you just need to move data back and forth between adjacent nodes in the ring. I can cover this next week, so if you guys want me to talk about Cassandra, I can cover what they do. So, that's, so they didn't invent consistent hashing. It came from MIT in the late 90s, early 2000s. If you know BitTorrent, they had the distributed hash table all right, when, you run, when you have magnet links. It's running the same kind of protocol, consistent hashing. Um, that's a good question. Okay. All right, so now the distinction between logical partitioning and physical partitioning, again, in a shared disk system, Logical partitioning basically means that the execution nodes will be assigned to some portion of the database to, be to, to, to operate on when it executes queries. Right? So the shared disk is going to have all the data. So let's say we have four tuples here, IDs one through four. Uh, and then we'll logically assign these different execution nodes to be responsible for data, for, for some portion of, of this data. So if I have a query that says I want to get ID 1, it's always going to go to this node here because it's, that's, it's, that logical partition has been assigned to it. Same thing, if I need to get ID 3, I go to the bottom one here. So the key thing here is, again, the physical location of the data is always in our black box shared disk, right? And underneath the covers, the shared disk system, whether it's EBS or a file server, could be doing its own partitioning uh, and, and parallelism down there, but we don't know that in our, in our database system. But then when it comes time to execute queries, we know that one node will be responsible for some, again, for that portion of the data. Now contrast this with physical partitioning as you would have in a shared nothing environment. Now the actual physical copies of the data are assigned to this node. Because again, in a shared nothing environment, it, it has its copy, it has the disk, and it's going to maintain state there. So again, it's just like before, anytime I have a query that says I want to get ID 1, I know go, I go get it from there and I get ID3 down here. Right, so again, the partitions could be done or done where we're actually physically storing the data if we control where the data is being stored, as in a shared nothing environment, or it just could be how do we assign which node should read which data at runtime when we execute queries. All right, so now, as I said in the beginning, joins are the most expensive operation you can have in a distributed OLAP system. And 
to no surprise, the partitioning scheme of how you decide to, to divide your database up, again, whether it's physically or logically, uh, will greatly affect the performance of your join algorithms. Right? So the, the most naive approach to do distributed joins is you just try to get the, all the tables you want to join onto a single node and perform the join there. Right? And this obviously wouldn't work if your tables are really large and it sort of defeats the purpose of having a distributed database because you get no parallelism because you always have to shove everything to a node and then do the join. Right? So we need, a, we need a better way to handle this. So there's going to be four different scenarios we could, we could possibly have in, the, in a distributed join. Um, for this example, let's say we have two tables, T1, T2, or A and B. Um, the basic idea here is that we're going to try to distribute the join across all of our nodes, all of our partitions, and we need to figure out what data do we need to get, or, or what data do we have, or what data do we need on that node in order to compute our portion of the join. And just like we had in uh, two-phase commit, where we had a sort of a coordinating node to, to, to commit the transaction, we'll have a coordinating node that's responsible for coalescing the results from all the different partitions that are running our, our join in parallel, and then combining them together into a single result to send back to the application. And this typically is whatever the node that, got the, that first got the, uh, the query request. It doesn't have to be. It could be, though. So the key thing I want to point out here, though, is that the, the join algorithm at the partition, the lo what we'll call the, the local join, that's going to be all the same join algorithms that we talked about before. Right? Your hash joins, your nested loops, and your, your sort merge joins. There's no magic join that we're going to do because we're in a distributed environment that's going to make this go much, 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 much faster. It really is just trying to figure out what data do we have and what data do we need, and then moving things around as, as needed. So the first scenario is where the, uh, you have two, the two tables, T1, T2, and T2 is going to be smaller than the uh, T1, and then it's just going to be replicated at every single partition. So now to, to compute this join, Right, so say we, again, we have a query as we want to join T1 on I, T1.ID with T2.ID. So we partition our T1 table based on the ID column, and then T2 is replicated everywhere. So that means each partition can compute the join on the data they have locally without coordinating with anybody else at all, compute their, their, their localized join, and then the one partition will send their output of the, of the query to the other partition who then combines them together and then produces the, the final answer. Right? And we do this because we know that all the data we could possibly join, all tuples for to join T1 with T2, every partition has a complete copy of T2, so there's not some other tuple that we, we could be missing. Right? And this is equivalent to us putting T1 and T2 on a single node and producing the, the, the final answer. The next uh, scenario is another best case scenario is where T2, T1 and T2 are both partitioned on the join key or the join attribute. So again, same thing here, that we don't have to get any additional data at each partition from another node. They have everything that they need. So we just do our sort merge or hash join or nested loop, it's almost always a hash join, uh, to compute our local uh, join op output and then the other guy sends the data over the network to this other one who combines it together and produces the final result. All right, so these are easy, right? Things now get tricky when things are not partitioned so easily. So the next scenario is where T1 is, is still partitioned on, on ID, and we want to join on ID, but now T2 is partitioned on some other key that we're not joining on. So in this case here, it's, it's, it's the value key. So in this case, if we decide that um, we would decide uh, whether T2 is, which we figure out whether T1 is smaller than T2, and whatever which one is smaller, we're going to copy that smaller table, uh, we're going to move that data around to the different tables, or different partitions, so that we can then compute the join. So in this case here, say T1 is larger than T2, uh, we'll end up making another copy of, of T2, a portion of T2 at each partition, where it's essentially partitioned on the thing we want to join on. So what happens is 
all the different nodes, the partitions, have to broadcast out their copies or, or the tuples they have for T2, and they send it to the, to the partition that has the based on the partitioning key. So again, so say I'm using hash part or, or, or range partitioning for, for T1, and my range is 1 to 100 for this. So over here, for any tuple, I would have to scan all of them, look at their value, the ID value, and then look at the partitioning scheme for, for the T1, and assign, figure out what partition to send it to. So now I end up in the same case after I do my copy, my broadcast, what I showed you in the second scenario, where now on a single partition, I have both the data for T1 and T2 with just the, the where we just have the, the ranges of the ID values, or the ID attribute, that we need to join. So now once I have this, I have now the copy of T1 partition on ID, T2 copy uh, partition on ID, and I can compute the join for them at each partition, then send the result over, and then coalesce them. All right, so now we're getting progressively more expensive here, right? Because we're moving data around. And, you know, if it's a couple megs, who cares? But if it's billions of tuples, this starts to get expensive. Furthermore, I'm also only showing two partitions here. What if I have 1,000 now, right? Now I have 1,000 nodes sending messages to another 1,000 nodes to copy data around. Yes? Uh, so, so your question is, like these guys? All right, so, 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 so we start with this, right? We recognize that T2 is not, not partitioned on the thing we want to join, right, ID. And that, that should be ID there. That's a mistake. But anyway, they we're not partitioned on ID, so we make a new copy, a second copy of, of the table where it, it is partitioned ID. We have to send all our tuples around, right? And then, again, this is, think of this as like a temporary table, right? And it just gets stored in the buffer pool like everything else. If it gets swapped to disks, that's how you know. That's what we have to do because we don't. We only have so much memory, right? But it's temporary. It's only used for this one query. Then I do my join locally at each each, each node or each partition, and then now I have a. For each partition has a slice of the join result. So this one has on P1 it has the join result for T1, T2 partition ID for these ranges, and the same thing with the other side. Where, where, where would this be stored? This is just the output of the query. Yes. So it gets put, get, again, get, you, get, you could stream it. Yes, as every time, yes. Yeah. So his question is, where are we going to store the output of the join at each partition? So, yeah, so, so the, the naive thing is that you could, you could just materialize the result, store it in your buffer pool, and then once you have all the results for, for, your, for your join, your join's done, then you transmit it to the coordinating node that's going to combine them together, right? Which could be another node. Could be, be another node, yes. It could be another node involved in the query, or it could, or it could be another node that's designed to just to do aggregations like this, right? And so uh, what I thought you were actually asking is, do we have to materialize this, or can, like, do we have to wait until we get the final result done before we send it? And the answer is no. You could just have like a thread say, all right, every single time I get a tuple, I'll just stream it over the network and have this guy start you know, co coalescing that as needed. Right? It doesn't matter. Right? The, the, again, the expensive part is always is, always is the, 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 the broadcasting. Yes? Do you ever run into the problem where like, the, uh, the coordinating node does not have enough memory to fit the entire like, output of the query? Oh, absolutely. So his, que so, uh, his question is, do you ever run into the problem where the uh, the coordinating node does not have enough memory to store the entire result. Absolutely, yes. But again, th th so it's a, think of it, it's, it's, it's a, we would have this problem in, in a single node case as well, right? If the output result's too big, you run out of memory, then, th you know, some thread, the, th the thread that's sending back the result to the application is going to just essentially do a sequential scan on that, sending back the tuples, and things get swapped in uh, as, you know, as needed, right? So in a, I, mean, I don't talk too much about MapReduce, but in a MapReduce environment, like, a, like something like Hadoop, uh, 
uh, they don't actually always coalesce the result into a single answer. You could have each of these guys write out the HDFS directly, right? And then the, the client has to then put, put everything back together. But typically, again, if you open up the terminal, you send your select statement, you get one, you want to get, you expect to get one piece of output back. All right, so in this case here, again, the bottom one was not uh, partitioned on our join attribute. The top one was. What's obviously even worse than this, where both tables are not partitioned on the join key, right? This is the worst case scenario. So let's say, hey, now, T1 is now partitioned on the name attribute. T2 is partitioned on value, just like before. So we're essentially going to do that same broadcast that we had before, but now we're making a complete another copy of, of both of the tables. So this is sometimes called reshuffling. Uh, and again, it's just, again, you're just essentially repartitioning the data so that you can then do your join uh, locally. Right? So to do the same thing, we'll send all the uh, tuples with the IDs in these ranges to the different partitions. Same thing for value. Then when it's done, uh, we can do our join and then coalesce them. So, yes? His question is, her statement is, is this just, is, is this just not like MapReduce? Yes. Uh, if you go, there's a paper if you Google, uh, I think, comparison to large scale data analysis or something like that. If you read that paper, it basically lays out the, uh, how MapReduce is essentially the same thing as, as joins and aggregations from distributed databases from the 1980s. Um, People don't like that paper. At least when it came out, they did not like it. Uh, I, I helped write that paper. Uh, but yes, th th I say it's a very astute observation. MapReduce essentially is just aggregations and, re and reshuffling the same way. So, and now when you look at, nobody really writes raw MapReduce queries anymore. Everyone writes, uh, even, you know, there's the, the specialized shared disk systems like Impala. Uh, Stinger and Presto that can do things on top of HDFS, and they're, they can do more efficient query plans than what sort of a, a naive MapReduce, uh, MapReduce um, uh, you know, program can do. But one thing, I mean, everyone should know what MapReduce is, right? And Hadoop, right? It's a bit data technology, but everyone should be aware of it. So one important distinction between what MapReduce does and what I'm showing here is and it's sort of related to his question, is that this output here of the join is not actually durable. Meaning if we crash while we execute this query, that intermediate result is lost. But in MapReduce, at, at every single time they do the map and then the reduce, and, and, right, they're writing out the HDFS, multiple copies of the data. And they do this because if one machine goes down while you're processing your, your, your query or your program, then another machine can pick up and where you left off. right? It's slow, but it makes it so that you can uh, be more fault tolerant. And they do that because uh, and they're targeting an environment with thousands of nodes. Where in most cases, the distributed databases are so fast that you typically don't run with a thousand machines. Right? You run either in much, much smaller number of machines, and therefore the, the failures are less common. Um, I think in some, I, get, I, I can't think names offhand. In some systems now, they do actually do materialize and store on disk uh, some of the intermediate results so that things are durable. But in practice, nobody does this, right? If you crash one minute of this join, the whole query just qu crashes. And you, you know, it's, it's not a big deal, you just execute it again. In the old days, when your queries could take hours to run, when it wasn't a column store, that would suck. Um, but now the systems have gotten pretty fast where it's, it's okay. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much it. That one, one, the cover for um, OLAP systems. Uh, the building an efficient OLAP system is obviously hard. Uh, the the network is always the main bottleneck. There's no way to get around this. Um, but all the things we talked about before of trying to reduce the amount of work we do on a single node system definitely apply here. So you want to make sure you pick a right join ordering for your, for your query so that you try to filter things out as, as early as possible so you're not moving all this, this data around. 
right? Or you want to figure out how, you know, there might be a, a, a join ordering that's less efficient um, for your database because your, your keys are, your, your tables are partitioned one way versus for another query, or same query on another partitioning scheme, another join ordering might be more efficient. So there's just more information we have to now take in consideration when we do, when we, you know, do query planning and, and scheduling and execution than we'd have to do in a single node system. Yes? Um, for OLAP, uh, are they, those queries usually run with the lower isolation level so you don't have um, lots of blocking while uh, an hour-long OLAP queries run? So this question is, in, a, um, in an OLAP environment, are the queries typically run with a lower isolation level? So if all your queries are read-only, isolation levels don't mean anything, right? Um, but then typically, yes. Uh, typically what happens is uh, snapshot isolation is, is good enough, right? I just want to read a consistent snapshot. Um, it's often the case what happens is that changes are, are pushed into an OLAP system in batches. Like at the end of every day, take all the market data I've collected and all the trades I've made and shove it into my OLAP system. So now if you're running your query during the day, you're, not, you're going to see yesterday's data, not today's data. That's not great, but some people, that, that, that's OK. Um, in the HTAP environments, that's when things get more tricky, when you're actually doing fast transactions and analytics at the same time. And again, snapshot isolation is good enough. But another way to think about this, too, is that uh, OLAP queries don't really care that much about absolute correctness, right? Like, Say I have, a, I have my database and I, I'm keeping track of everything every, everyone's bought on, on Amazon. Do I really care whether it's 1,000 or 1,001, um, I don't know what the hot toy is this year, but like of you know, a, some particular pillow, do I care to get the exact count of that? No, right? And so that's why in, in, in other queries you usually don't care about. And there's a whole other area called approximate systems, approximate database systems that can use sampling and other things to actually estimate what the answer should be. And even then, for some workloads, for some environments, that's good enough. I don't need to know exactly the number of items I bought within you know, a one month window, as long as I'm close enough, right? as long as I'm not, not off by orders of magnitude. But typically, yes, you run, the, you run, the, um, you run your queries, OLAP queries in lower isolation level. All right, and then the other key thing that I want to stress too, in a OLAP environment, um, the, typically you want to push the query to the data as much as possible, right? You don't want to have to, like in my, my first example, I said, all right, I want to put, try to pull all the data I, I need to do my join onto a single node and then compute the join once I have everything, right? That obviously be, is, is really inefficient because you lose parallelism and you're sending a lot of data around. But it'd be much, much easier to send a small query fragment, which will be, you know, kilobytes, maybe at most megabytes, over to different nodes and have them execute in parallel, right? So that's way, way more efficient to send the queries out rather than, than send the data out. So typically in OLAP systems, you try to maximize the, the or you try to minimize the amount of data you have to, you have to push around or pull around to, to the system. You want to try to get everything to be on a single node that's already there and do all the processing that you can. Okay. So this covers everything for the, uh, well, one that would be included in the final, but also in sort of the core database topics you need for, for the semester. Um, again, there's, there's a bunch of other advanced topics that we'll cover in, in the spring semester and then whole other, other areas of, of databases where people are doing interesting things. Um, but everything I talked about here today or, or in this entire semester is what you need to sort of build a basic database system. And everything you do on top of that is just sort of you know, extra goodness. So on, uh, on, on Monday next week, again, we'll have Barry Morris come talk about new ODB, and then we'll have the final of review and the systems potpourri on, on next week. And obviously, everything covered next week will not be on the final at all. OK? Any questions? Yes? Your question is, can all the queries be distributed across all nodes? Uh, yes. Ideally, if you don't have to, though, you don't, you don't want to. Yes. Yes.
so, 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 so I think your question is like, when a query shows up, should you always break it up into a to different fragments that get sent to all nodes? Your question is, is it always viable to do this? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Which we don't care about. Uh, is, 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 there, is there any possible query that, ignoring security, that in, or for, for correctness reasons has to be run on a single node? No. Right? That's sort of the beauty of the relational algebra is that you can break these things up and distribute them and sort of put them back together. Right? Okay. All right, we're done, guys. Awesome. Uh, see you on Monday. And I will send out uh, additional information about the, uh, what's expected for the extra credit uh, probably tomorrow.